Have we found Kate Middleton? Why is something about her still not open? What is going on with all of this Potomac, Miami, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills casting? Lisa Rinna has announced she's officially not returning. And I am probably going to get into some really unpopular opinions. So I hope you're ready for it. Let's dive in. You're listening to No Filter with Zach Peter, your go-to source for all the latest pop culture and reality TVT, Surf Fresh, all week long. Now, let's dive in. And dive in we shall. I hope you are ready because I have one of your favorites back on the podcast today. He is the host of the Unpopular Podcast, and he's got a lot of hot takes, as do I. So we're probably going to piss you off a little bit today. Please welcome back Jacques Peterson. Thanks for having me back. This is my first time recording with you from From the the U.S., and... It's my first time on the pod with you as a brunette. So oh, I'm yeah. used to you doing the whole I'm the platinum blonde bitch with all the tea and it's a new era. You know, people say that I'm a lot more um I'm a lot more like feisty than I was when I was blonde. Well, the real you is coming out more. I've been trying to tell people for a long time cuz I've known you for like a few years now. I'm like, "No, Zach's like, you know, Zach's like pretty based behind the scenes <laughs> yeah so um what we were just in we've been hanging out a, a lot lately but we were just in culver city um and jacques has committed you know now that he's a true californian he's committed his first felony i know i had to join in with uh, the rest of the vagrants and and criminals i didn't do a smash and grab but i did steal <laughs> a tray from in and out by accident we we met up in Culver City and you wanted to go, I think, to the Culver Hotel, right? Which is yes. really beautiful. Yes. Yeah. It's very fancy. And we got to the door and I'm like, Zach, like, this is too fancy. Like, we're going to In-N-Out. So we went to In-N-Out Burger and it was so patched because it was on a weekend. It was like a zoo in there. And I was, like, very anxious in there. I think we both were. I was like, this is, like, a lot. Like, there's like, was a lot of people in here. So chaotic. It was feral and chaos. And then when I went up to order, they were like, eat in or to go. And I kind of feel like I was just flustered. And I just went, ah, oh, eat in. And you got yours to go. And then I'm yeah, like, I was like, Jack, where are those- you going to eat? It? There's no, there's nowhere to stand in this place. You convinced me to steal the tray i was like oh my god it was a little plastic tray i was like they're not gonna miss because i had my bag with my food and he had his food on a tray and at first i told him you can put your food in my bag and he was like no i need to keep my little tray and then i was like well we're not gonna eat here so i don't know what you want to do so then he wanted to go to the park across the street which was owned by homeless people and i was like there's nowhere to sit or eat there and also we're gonna have to play frogger to get across the road to even get to that park and so then we uh, we ended up going back to the Culver Steps, and Jacques and it was walked away with his tray, like he was at it the cafeteria. Was so, it was so cold and windy, and then because my in and out was exposed on the tray as I was like walking there, it was like it was like putting my in and out in front of like an air conditioner. While your, yours was like toasty and like ruminating and like the hot steam of the bag, and uh, yeah, it was a bit of a disaster. And then. I was like, should I go back and return the tray? And you're like, shark, like throw it out. And I was like, so scared. Well, but- because we were like a 10 minute walk away from the in and out. I was like, you're going to walk 10 minutes all the way back just to give them their plastic tray. Do you know how many people accidentally throw them away? Like they have accounted for this. I'm like, listen, you're in Gavin Newsom state now. You're allowed to steal. It's okay. It's a, it's a badge of honor at this point to be a criminal in California. Yep. Committed my first crime. I'm becoming a true Angelino. I love it. <laughs> so that was that was our, our weekend adventure. Um, but we got talking about we were talking about the Kate Gate stuff um, and, and something about her because we'll actually let's start with something about her because I feel like that's kind of juicy. So we saw that something about her is now they now have some sort of like Uber Eats licensing deal where they're going to have kitchens all throughout the country that you can Uber Eats something about her sandwiches. But there's more to the real story as to why something about her has not yet opened. And it's because, which I just discovered, Katie and Ariana don't actually own the trademark to something about her. 
Yeah, I heard this a few weeks ago when I was out on the town getting all the scoop and uh, I was out in West Hollywood with some people that are kind of connected to the Pomp Rules world and they were like, you know why something about her hasn't opened yet? And I was like, because they haven't got their shit together. And they were like, no, the chef, I can't remember her name, but she's the one, she was featured on one of the episodes, I believe, when they were doing interviews for like staff for something about her. She owns the trademark. And, What's her name, Patty um, Penny? Yes, that that one owns the trademark and Katie and Ariana, I mean, this is so stupid. Look, I understand Ariana not being on top of it because she had a lot going on with her dancing with the stars. Oh, you life. expected kind of- Katie to be the one that was on top of it? <laughs> well, Katie was always like Katie and Schwartz. Katie always seemed like the organized one that was like getting on Schwartz for being a total slob. Although actually flashing back to old school banner pump. I remember when everyone had their businesses going and Katie was like, oh, I'm going to start like a beauty blog, pucker and pout. And then okay. we- <laughs> and she <laughs> would knit. Do you remember when she was knitting on the couch? Yes. Yeah, so we should have known she wouldn't be on top of the business. Side I of knew she wouldn't be on top of the business. I don't know why you're giving her so much clout. Well, what I heard was that this, you know, the chef, let's just put allegedly in case it's not all true. I've got the person wrong, but whatever. We've seen the files because some fan sites have leaked them now. We've seen the trademark application, but I heard that at some point the chef that owned the trademark was like, oh, I want to be, it was either like, I want to be an equal partner with you guys, or I want like a higher percentage, something like that. And Katie and Ariana apparently were like, well, no, we already, you know, had a handshake deal on what your, you know, yeah, what your role would be. And then she was like, well, I own the trademark, so you're not getting it. And I assume they've been in negotiations trying to like sort it out, but that's why it hasn't opened. Which is interesting. And so what I think happened, because we were discussing this, what I think probably happened is Katie and Ariana had no real experience on how to handle any of this, right? This chef chick who we think is allegedly the one that's holding something about her hostage, she was probably like, listen, I've done this a million. I know how to do this, whatever. Like, I'll go on legal Zoom. I'll file for the trademark. Like, I got you guys. Right. And then she saw the popularity and she saw because when they were building something about her, Scandal hadn't broken yet. So I'm pretty sure the chef was like, oh, yeah, I'll help you guys out. I'll put my name out there, whatever. And then in the end realized how big this had all gotten and wanted to pull a Rachel Levis and was like, well, I want to cash in on it now too. And so she wanted a piece of the pie and they didn't really want to give her the piece of the pie that she wanted. And so she started, it sounds like this is my own speculation. It sounds like she's holding the company hostage now. Um, that's a good point, actually, that Scand- I didn't even connect the dots. Scandival didn't even happen when they started this, and then obviously yeah. she saw dollar signs. Because the, although- original, the original finale was their tasting. Remember, she came out and she made all the little green goddess sandwiches for everyone, and Ariana was crying, and then Katie was yelling at Rachel. Yes, and um, the thing is, in her defense, to like give her the benefit of the doubt— Perhaps with Scandival blowing up, the workload and everything increased for her because suddenly there was so much more pressure on her. Maybe they wanted to then expand the menu and they had all these, you know, there's the merch. Cause like I And I'm sure she getting... wasn't getting a cut of the merch. I'm sure Katie and Ariana were keeping that and she's like, Well, where's that money going? And you know. Yeah. So look, I'm sure there's multiple sides to the story. Hey, if the uh if the chef wants to go on no filter, I'm sure she has an open invitation to spill the tea. Listen, always um, hit slide into my DMs. Let's get it. But I just feel like it was probably she just probably wanted a piece of the pie and they're probably trying to negotiate. But it's interesting that they decided to go with the Uber Eats licensing deal. I'm wondering, have we seen Katie or Ariana promote that or is that just an Uber Eats announcement that they've made? I haven't seen them. Pro- like, could there be any... <sighs> Because, like, it's possible that the chef went off and is like, hey, Uber Eats, I'll negotiate this deal to do this. And Katie and Ariana have no, because they're not promoting it. I haven't seen them promote. Maybe they have and I've just missed it, but I have not seen them promote any of this. That's interesting. But I wonder if maybe, look, I don't know how trademarking works, guys. So don't get up in the fucking comments of like, this is just speculation. But, um, I wonder if maybe like the trademark was only for like a like a physical like a retail space maybe like a brick and mortar. Possibly, but then yeah. If you, so then maybe they're being like, well, we're going to make it like an Uber Eats deal, so we're not. I don't know. I wonder if it could be something like that, or maybe they've actually sorted it out now, and then they've what the agreement is is we're going to do an Uber Eats deal because there's a lot of money in it for all of us. I mean, if I was um 
Ariana and uh, Katie, I would actually just come forward, tell exactly what happened. I would share it on the show because it's actually a good storyline. Yeah. And then I would um, rename it and have a new brand for it and just go, you know what? You can keep something about her. We have a new name for the sandwich shop. And then look, that gives you more storyline. It's more content. It's actually like puts the sandwich shop more yeah. they can in call the it, spotlight. Uh, Maddox and Maloney's. Yeah, perfect. Like, do something like that, totally. Um, or even go, you know what, we're not going to do a sandwich shop anymore. We're going to do a, I don't know, a fucking juice bar. Something like that. I would do that, milk it for the storyline next season. Smart. There you go. I agree. I think it's the smarter option um, for them to just lean into it. But I, I think they're not leaning into it because, like, I don't think Ariana cares. She's, like, doing chicago and dancing with the stars and she just bought her new house and like she's fine she's like living her life she doesn't care about the sandwich shop if anything it's probably a thorn in her side yeah well she didn't tell uh she didn't tell katie that she was doing dancing with the stars even though that was her business partner so that was a little bit like "Mm." i mean things are sort of turning against ariana now a bit (laughs) you can feel the tides turn well her brother turned against her and then the cast is all against her like the only buddy the only person that's in her court is katie at this point katie should also turn against her and be like listen the business is fucked up because ariana doesn't have time to pay attention to it yeah you know what's so funny though because i'm such a contrarian I was kind of like a little bit against Ariana in the beginning. And now that everyone's like trashing her, I'm kind of like, all right, give the girl a break, you know? (laughs) Cause I, I do feel like with the show, with everyone going, Oh, we're so sick of Ariana being so bitter and stuff. It's like, please remember that she filmed this like a few months, a couple months after. Yeah. It was still fresh for her and, you know, good for her cashing in. I think I felt like honestly with both sides of the Ariana thing, like I felt like when it happened, it was like, okay, We've t- turned her into this like George Floyd figure now because she was cheated on. Like, oh this God! Is re- <laughs> Don't this pull is a ridiculous. Sandoval and compare her to George Floyd. <laughs> That's what people were acting like. It was the most ridiculous thing that I've said. Like the investment people had, it was like she was this saint. It was like okay, she was cheated on, and now and like I could see all the deals coming in straight away and the clout and how popular she was i mean that's the general take now that everyone has but i saw that like straight away i'm like guys trust me well she had that she had that glow up that like brandy glanville had right when everybody loved and embraced i think brandy glanville's a better comparison than george floyd but like brandy you know she got (laughs) cheated on by eddie cibrian and then she had all these book deals and her book was number one and she was like the breakout housewife that everybody really loved at the time and then she ended up ruining that and continuing to circle the drain with her reality tv career um but like at one point yeah but like at one point like brandy was embraced for being the woman that was done dirty and everybody hated eddie and leanne same thing with ariana you know i mean it did i don't think it had the the international you know breaking news piece of it that scandaval had because like everybody was fucking talking about scandaval um But, I mean, I don't know. I just, I've gone back and forth with Ariana. Like, even at the reunion when everyone's like, she was so mean to Rachel, and she told her to fuck herself with a cheese grater. I was like, this was the first time she had seen this bitch since she found out about, since she saw her coochie on Sandoval's phone two weeks ago, you know? No, I I 100% agree. Like, I mean, I thought the reunion was vile, and I thought it was bullying, and I thought it was... Honestly, I thought it was really nasty. Before Raquel came out with all this lawsuit stuff, I was like, I'm imagine if she killed herself after this. Like, this was horrific. But, t- of course, like, you're on a reality show. You're getting pumped up. That was the first time Ariana saw them. I get it. I was more mad at, like, Lala and James, not so much Ariana. But the point I was making before is I felt like a lot of the love for Ariana, it got a little bit o- <laughs> over the freaking top. And now I feel like with the way that it's flipped and people are being so nasty to her, it's also like, okay, calm down. Like she's allowed to be like bitter and a bit angry. I just feel like yeah. people have got a little too invested on like both sides of it. I like everyone on the show, by the way, this season, I'm not team anybody. I, yeah. everybody on, this is the reason I like this season is I can see where everybody is coming from. Like, you know, a lot of people are attacking Katie. I totally get where Katie's coming from. I totally get where Sandoval's coming yeah. from, from La La. Like I'm into everybody's perspective. And I think that's what makes it actually really interesting because they're all coming at things from different angles. But I'm I like, agree. I get why they feel like that. 
I no, I agree. I don't. I really don't have any skin in the game with any of. That. I think they're all collectively making the show good. Um, and Ariana becoming like the the new villain, like has kind of like been like the twist that nobody really. I mean, I guess I kind of expected that going into it, just because when you reach such, when you're overexposed so much, the way that she was, the only other place to come is down. Um, I will say, and I think I texted you this the other day, and I think you posted something about it on Instagram about Lala being just like a real game player in this because she was so hard anti Sandoval and now she's completely turning on Ariana in the press being like you know she's got her head up her ass and yet she says that this is so toxic to be with Sandoval yet she's still living with him like she's going she's really you know she's become a bit of a voice of reason on the show you know I think Lala is probably my favorite at the moment she's become a bit of a voice of reason but it also there's absolutely an element of strategy to it oh and 1, playing a reality tv game and i Smart. take my hat off to lala because even at the beginning of the season when she made that call to reach out to raquel that's when they you know thought rachel whatever was going to come back on the show and they were probably all thinking um how are we going to do this season without her when it's actually been completely i think it's been better without her to be honest but i never thought it would have been that great if they brought her back to be honest with you yeah but at that time they were probably thinking holy shit we need to get her back and the fact she was the first one to like reach out there and i'm just like i predicted that i actually predicted that lala would be the one to do it because she was so anti-man with randall that i'm like the only way rachel can get back into everyone's good graces is through lala and i think lala was smart enough to recognize that herself unless she was listening to no filter but i always said that lala was the only gateway because lala could come from that anti-man perspective to bring Rachel in to be like she was groomed by Sandoval and she was you know doing all these things and Lala literally set her up for a perfect entry back into the show and instead of doing that she fumbles the ball and launches her stupid podcast where she can't shut up about any of it yes the the worst podcast ever made I mean I feel bad for Raquel to be honest (laughs) because I just feel like she has bad a bad team that's guided her in the wrong direction but um yeah lala is the epitome of understanding the assignment and and knowing the moves to make for the show and that's another reason why i'm not when i'm watching this show and i'm just enjoying it i'm not getting caught up in this weird team sports of like team katie team ariana whatever because i'm like look everyone's making a show there's a level of like artifice to this yeah um just look at the way Sorry, look at the way some of them are moving. And yeah, you know, everybody's feelings are valid. I wish I had a stronger th- opinion on there. What hating. do you think happens next with Vanderpump? Because there's, so Alex Baskin did his interview with the New York Times where he said that this season was really challenging in terms of getting the cast to come back together and film with Sandoval. Now we kind of see them all turning on Ariana and Ariana's kind of put herself and Katie on an island. They don't even really have something about her at this point that I think they can easily cut out Ariana and Katie. Um, Like, do you think we put all our eggs in the Valley and, and, and maybe reboot Vanderpump the way that they wanted to do with Roni originally? Or do you think, I don't know if I see them canceling Vanderpump only because the ratings are so strong and the Valley had a great premiere. They were what over 700,000. Yeah. Okay. They're absolutely not rebooting Vanderpump just yet. They tried that a few years ago. It didn't work. Um, Everyone is sort of acting like everybody from Vanderpump is now just going to move over to the Valley. They have a huge cast on the Valley. They have new people. Like it's not good for the network to just reuse the same people all the time. You need new people with new stories and stuff. Now, I'm not saying that people from Vanderpump won't eventually go over to the Valley. I could certainly see that happening at some point because yeah. they, are, they are an authentic group of friends. They all know each other. I was at the Valley premiere and I talked to some of the new people and they've known them for years and they've been around and some of them have been in the background on Vanderpump Rules episodes. So this is a very real group of friends, but they're not just going to move everybody over to the Valley straight away. Vanderpump Rules is hotter than ever. It's a great show. I mean, it's really, really good. They only had... Um, really one terrible season, which was the Ray Chella season. I think that might have been during <laughs> that was COVID. a bad that was the that season was, nine, right? Yeah. That was the yeah, I couldn't even that was the only one I couldn't get through. I mean, the season before where they brought in the new people wasn't great either, but the one after was even worse. But last season, even before Scandaval happened, last season was actually amazing. And then Scandaval happened and made it even better. But it was yeah. already like I remember when that last season started, I'm like, damn, like I had written off Vanderpump rules as like, who cares? You know, I was sort of over it going, you know what? I had a good run. And then I 
felt like it still had some juice and Scandaball happened, made it even bigger. This season to me is fantastic. They don't need to get rid of anybody. Um, we already have new people coming in like, um, uh, Ariana has her boyfriend. We've got Ali Luba there. I just, I think they're killing it. I think just keep doing what they're doing. I, well, and it seems like Ariana's brother wants to come back in and he seems like he's pretty team Sandoval based off of, you know, what we found He'll out. He'll do of- anything. He is so thirsty. Cause remember he was, um, I think the Ray Chella season was the one where he started dating Billy Lee. Oh yeah. Is that- <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I remember At some Billy point, Lee. he started dating like Billy Lee to try get on the show. Maybe that was prior to that, but he, I don't know. If I was Ariana, I would be like, "You've got to be shitting me," because you know what? Even if your sister is feeling herself and she's, you know, off filming Lifetime movies and doing, you know, tampon ads on Instagram and whatever and making a buck, like, don't fucking call her out publicly like keep it in the family like well, dude, and what are you doing not only that but then to like publicly be like seen with sandoval and hugging him and joking with him and then to be like i don't know season 12 i guess we're gonna have to find out balls in ariana's court we'll see how soon i hear from her in order to see where my stand stands I was like, that's it's actually oof. sickening to me and yeah. what fame will do to people i mean it's one thing to have thirsty friends that'll throw you under the bus or whatever to get on tv like I'm sure if you're on Vanderpump Rules, you expect that to happen and you expect people to become friends with you to, like, you know, try get on television. But when it's, like, your own fucking sibling and then they go with your mortal enemy to the press, like, it's just foul. Yeah. Um, What did you think of all this Kate Gate stuff? Because now there's all these new conspiracies that are coming out. I kind of ranted about this on, on Monday's episode of the podcast where I was talking about how people were getting mad at me because I was like going through some of the theories. And I was like, you know what? Of all the theories, her possibly having bulimia, like this could possibly check out. And now everyone's like, do you feel bad about yourself? She has cancer. And now you should feel bad, you piece of shit. And I'm just like, I didn't give her fucking cancer, number one. And number two... Like, I feel badly that she has cancer, but this is what happens when you don't address the rumors and you let it get so out of control. And the royal family went and put that stupid Photoshop photo out there where they took her face from the Vogue magazine cover and put it on the photo with the kids. And then they put out a statement like, oops, that was me, Kate, and I was just playing on Canva. Sorry, LOL. And then we pretended that went away with the 19 edits that were done in that metadata. And then we had all the Kate doubles or the Kate and Kate and uh, Williams double that was coming up at the farm. And so I'm just like, no, the Royal family was fumbling the ball here. And because they were feeding into these other little things, it only caused more of this speculation and more of us to talk about this stuff. So I don't, yeah, I, I can't deal with the the crybaby parade for Kate now of, of not in terms of the cancer that is sad. <laughs> and it's like, yes, but I'm talking about- No, it about- is sad. And I told them, I was like, listen, guys, my dad has cancer. It's an incurable type of cancer. Like, I can empathize with the cancer yeah. side of it, you know, and I feel badly for her. Yeah, no, my dad literally died of cancer. So, you know, I've had a friend die of cancer. Yeah. You know, I know it's no laughing matter, but I'm talking about the whole, um, the oh, my God, don't you guys feel terrible for no. speculating and spreading conspiracies? No, I don't. public figures. By the way, for the record, I just want to say, I didn't partake in the conspiracies <laughs> other than when it very happened very early on. I made yeah. one joke about it. I, I didn't follow. I don't care. Like, I'm actually not invested in the royal family, but I have nothing against anybody else that um went down the conspiracy route with it because it was fucking weird like i don't yeah. even i don't care about like i actually like kate middleton by the way and i am a Same. Meghan markle hater and I, i'm the one that got you to read that Meghan markle revenge book i'm like yeah. zach i think you were going between that and some like tory spelling or something for book yeah. club and i was like you've got to do this Meghan markle book with all the fucking tea on her so you know um i like Kate, but she's not immune from people yeah. making cons- – Why like aren't you're people, a public figure. Why aren't people fucking mad at Meghan Markle right now? Just because you happen to like Meghan Markle? She was, like, trashing William and Kate for the longest time, and then now all of a sudden she's like, oh, I feel bad. Kate has cancer. It's like, no, you were a fucking bitch to her, and why aren't we getting mad at her, but you're going to get mad at me for doing one podcast episode where I said, hey, maybe she has bulimia. And maybe she does. I don't know. We these There are so many more questions that we have and not answers. So – no, I don't feel bad for speculating and doing my job, which I do every day on this podcast, which is talk about what people are talking about in the news. 
also um, people forget their job is literally public figure. Like that's what their job is. Their job is to like be in public and to like get press <laughs> for the royal family and to go to ribbon cutting ceremonies, etc. And they use the press to their advantage whenever they want. So it's one of those things where like you can't just expect to have good press all the time. Like, yeah, it sucks that she has cancer and it was like, you know, when it came out, I kind of thought, yeah. oh, yikes, because I know a lot of people were like going, you know, because I didn't, but I know a lot of people were going down that path very heavily. And I kind of thought, oh, that might be a bit awkward for yeah. a few people. But I wasn't like clutching my pearls. Like, oh, don't you just feel terrible? It's like, no, because if – she came out with cancer and then people started saying really horrible things on top of it once she confirmed it. Then it's yeah. like, okay, you can call someone Which, out, but when they don't know and there's weird things with like Photoshopped photos coming out. And, and stunt like doubles, that. yeah. Yeah, and also like a lot of the quote conspiracies, it was like people were having a bit of fun. Like when Andy Cohen tweeted like, that ain't Kate. Like, girl, that's a funny tweet. Like yeah. you're having fun with it. It's My thing, thing is it's like in the news them all cycle. coming out and then like apologizing and be like, oh, we're so sorry. How dare we? We're so bad. And they're slapping themselves on the wrist. I'm like, guys, this is our fucking job is to talk about celebrities and pop culture. And when there's a fucking weird conspiracy going on with the Royal family, like to this day, there are still people that believe all the conspiracies about Diana. And we don't even know the truth about Diana. Um, listen, I feel, I do feel badly. It, you know, I, I, listen, Kate has kids. Kate has a family. Kate's coming for that crown. Like I want her to thrive, right? She is a queen. She is regal. I mean, but people are now dissecting the video and they're like, this is AI. Look at the bench behind her. Look at the, the, um, the ring on her, her finger that like disappears and then it reappears and then it disappears. So, I mean, people are still running with those conspiracies. I've kind of just let it go at this point, but I'm not going to apologize. Yeah. No, no, we're on the same page. It's fine to talk about Meghan Markle. It's fine to talk about Princess Kate. It's fine to talk about Diana, Charles, Camilla, any one of them, you know, also, why are Americans so offended specifically? They're fucking <laughs> English. Like, like Americans are acting like you were salted, you know, like the fucking Kennedys or something. Calm down, you know, 1960 or whatever. I know, no shit. Um, well, on Shout the out Princess Kate. Shout out, like listen, her. and we, we, I like Princess Kate. I want to make that clear. Like, it, none of my shade is toward her. My shade is one towards the royal family that fucked, that fumbled the ball with all of this, and shade towards everyone that was out there issuing their apologies because they were clutching their pearls and felt so fucking bad. And like, I was like, listen, you guys were, listen, and people were building their Instagram followings and people were doing all the shit and making all their money off of this. And, you know, we're running with it. And if you have a guilty conscience, then maybe you weren't doing it for the right reasons. Well, I just think never apologize. That's my thing. <laughs> I really learned that throughout, like, you know, 2020 and 2021, throughout COVID and just all the civil unrest and the, you know, cancel culture was peaking then and people yeah. getting fired left, right and center. And I really just realized, don't fucking apologize for anything. Who gives a fuck? Like, I've just <laughs> blocked them out and just do you. Well, because if you think about it, like, people just get bullied into apologizing and they don't genuinely mean it. You know what I mean? Of not. So it's like, as it's so Blake disingenuous at this Lively, point. As, as if like Lively was there going, oh my God, I can't believe that I said that. I feel like such a terrible person. Like that was, you know, her getting trolled on Instagram. Yeah. And the publicist going, you should probably like issue a statement and just, you know, nip this in the bud. It's like, okay. And it's like, who are you even apologizing for? Someone that's way too invested in the fucking royal family and, you know, trolls people on Instagram? Like, get a life. Go outside. It would you know, be... Like, do something. It would be different if they were shitting on Kate after finding out, like, knowing that she was battling cancer and then they were, like, making jokes about her cancer. That would be different. Then you're an asshole. You know, that's mm. different. There was speculation about the lack of answers that we were getting. And when you don't give us answers, we're going to make up our own narratives. Yeah, but you know what? I want to add something to this too, off the back of the Kate thing. As far as the conspiracies, conspiracies are going, yeah, it is pretty weird. Um, and I think you and I commenting on, you know, housewives and stuff, there is a culture of um, conspiracies around all this kind of reality television and celebrities that really goes so far off the deep end where people spend way too much time on all these kind of celebrity conspiracies. Um, and I feel like I see it a lot in the Bravo world. And like yeah. you and I, right, we know people that are on Bravo shows and we know kind of like 
secrets of production and stuff. And yeah. sometimes you'll see people coming up, even with the scandal, they're like, oh, I heard that it was all staged and that they met and they concocted this whole <sighs> thing. And it's like, no, they didn't. Like, not everything's a conspiracy. Um, and I think that... You know, with the growth of all the, like, the meme accounts and, like, the subreddits and stuff, I, some people are just spending too much time online and TikTok and, you know, not everything needs a TikTok deep dive. Sometimes it's actually not that interesting and people are just mining things for content, you know? Yeah, or, like, so many people were, like, making jokes about, like, I remember there was this one girl on TikTok and she was like, oh, my God, you guys, I was there when William and Kate were at the barn and they got into an argument and they were talking about how, you know, like, she was making she was making it seem like she was one of the witnesses that was, like, like witnessing William and Kate get into a fight before they had to walk out because the paparazzi was waiting for them, you know? And then people were sending that to me. They're like, look, she was actually there and she's saying that she overheard them fight. I'm like, guys, this is a fucking joke. Like, come on. Like, let's put our, our critical thinking cap on and like not like buy into every little conspiracy theory that there is like i fucking hate blind items and all that shit because it's all just bullshit oh i hate blind item culture so much like the amount of lies that i see come through blind items is crazy and to your point about that that girl that said that she, that she was there and she saw kate and william let me tell you something i work um for the daily mail and if somebody had an eyewitness account of Princess Kate, they're not just going to put it on the internet. They're going to a UK tabloid and they're going to yeah. sell that for like big bucks, yeah. you know, and and have a payday. They're not just going to like run and blurt it out for free because, you know, people pay for that. Yeah. Well, we usually end up in the end being on the right side of history <clears throat> with we exception do. for your love of, of Rachel. Um, that but... was my one, one um, major L. You know, I couldn't... I couldn't have predicted that she would have played it so bad, but I mean, I still stand by that the hate towards her. You know, it got it was so intense. Out of control. Yeah. Again, this is a popular take now that people are like, "Oh my god, they were too way too mean to rec-. like." I had that take very early on when everyone still had their pitchforks, and you know, I did feel like you're gonna bully this girl into you know suicide or something, and um. Yeah, she's made really, really bad career decisions afterwards with this whole, the podcast is awful. It's like, if you're going to talk about Scandaball every week on a podcast, you should have just gone back to the show. It's like, what you should, you should, getting tongue tied, Jesus Christ. What she should have done is either go back to the show and go through the motions there and, you know, address it or do the mental health treatment and then just sort of like back away go from away. the yeah. public eye. That's what she and, should have you know, done. Yeah don't do Scandaval podcast and every single episode is like a recap of Vanderpump rules. And she, like, she doesn't even have a voice or the personality for podcasting. And like, I, I was really going to bat for her for a while and going, no, she's like iconic because I could kind of see her, you know, going the, like the Monica, the Salt Lake Monica route of becoming maybe like leaning into it and becoming an iconic reality yeah. villain. Um, And she didn't do that. And I do think, I think I said this to you when we were, um, at Culver, I'm like, she's clearly, she's definitely like neurodivergent in a way where, um, I, yeah, I, I, I think she's being led down a path and I kind of feel, I feel bad for her. Um, I, I do. I don't and think I, she's making her own choices. And I, I think I said this on my podcast last week that after our conversation about that, I was like, you know what? I do think that she, like there are people that are pulling the strings with her, you know, cause like when you look back at her recent season, um, like pre scandaval uh like when she was fighting with Katie she was like a little chihuahua like she couldn't stand up to Katie and Lala like it's no wonder Lala ate her up for lunch every single time she went up against Lala and she was just like a deer in the headlights and like she just doesn't she's not a great reality she's never had a great personality she's never given us an iconic moment I know I'm gonna piss off your number one fan the discerning critic and he's gonna be in my DMs being like team Rachel team Jock <laughs> team Chunky I love him, I love him too I but love he's Jesse. always I love him too but he's always coming into my dms and being like team rachel team bethany and i'm just like okay i get it you're gonna go against anything i you know anything jacques goes for that i don't go for your team jacques 100 percent um as he should be as he should be yes um <laughs> but so 
she doesn't have like that person. So I did, when you put it in, into perspective for me like that, I was kind of like, uh, okay, I, I get it. And I see it from that lens. And I do have a little more empathy for her. And I don't think, you know, she's being guided appropriately, you know, she's full. She's fully like neurodivergent. Like she's this she's something, you know, I hate that fucking term. No, I know we, we were discussing it and I'm just trying to be PC about it now, but like, She's not all there and you can she's see very a lot sheltered. Of I think she's a pageant no, girl think- that was very sheltered and didn't get much exposure outside of her parents pimping her out in the pageant world. And I think all she knows how to do is to just be a pretty pageant girl that listens to whatever her parents tell her to do. And I don't think her parents are guiding her appropriately. I don't think these attorneys are guiding her appropriately. I don't, you know, to me, a lot of it just feels like people are, other people are trying to cash in on Scandaval and pitching it to her as like, you deserve to cash in on this. And she's just like, I deserve to cash in on this. And they're just trying to capitalize off of her. Like Bethany couldn't be bothered by it. Bethany was done with her when Bethany got her little interview. Yeah, it's actually, it's sad. But I agree it with is. you that she's used to being sort of controlled and doing the pageant thing. But I think it's like that on top of like, I, I think there's possibly something a little bit mentally there with her, which makes me feel bad. And I heard some tea inside a scoop where I won't say where I got it, but someone sort of told me a story about how um, they told her to do something in a scene and she literally just walked up and repeated what they had said verbatim without even questioning it. And it was at a really awkward time. And um, they were like shocked how easily she could be manipulated, like, you know, a puppet and that she also didn't seem to read a lot of social cues. And I think that plays into when you see her yeah. sort of smiling awkwardly, you see her smiling through things that she shouldn't be smiling at. And, it makes um, sense when you, when you presented it to me, I was like, okay, maybe there's like a little bit of, I mean, I know I don't think Asperger's is like a term people use anymore, but it see, it feels like maybe there's like a high level Asperger's. I mean, this is all speculation and conjecture. I, you know, like you said, like I've, told you have very mixed feelings about all that stuff as somebody that has worked in the autism community and has a brother that is more moderately to severely autistic um I mean I don't like to say severe I think he's more moderate because I I've seen severe individuals um and worked with many of those families so to me it's kind of hard to lump those two in where you see someone like Raquel that just doesn't know how to read social cues it was like the Tallulah Tallulah Willis thing that really pissed me off because she came out and she was just like I'm uh, I have autism and I you know and she's like so proud of the fact that she has autism and I'm just like sweetie read the fucking room because I get it you know maybe you do have some of these symptoms that are now being considered as autism but like the autism umbrella has been widely stretched over the recent years where to me I see individuals like my brother that cannot have a full-on conversation that will never be able to live on his own I've seen family members and seen parents broken because they have to institutionalize their child because those are very severe cases of autism autism is so much more than you know being a little quirky or not being able to pick up on social cues like there are real medical ailments that are that make it very challenging so that somebody like my brother can never live on his own. So when I see someone like Tallulah go on Instagram and parade her autism diagnosis, and that's not to say that there aren't individual quirks or intricacies or um, differences that we shouldn't be able to be proud of or acknowledge or, you know, appreciate. But I'm just saying with that umbrella term of autism, there is a very serious medical component to it that's more than just, I'm a little quirky. Because I'm like, Tallulah, I was looking at her Instagram and she's drinking beer at music festivals and hanging out with her friends. And I'm like, those are things my brother and other families that I know that I have worked with, you know, for many, many years that will never have those luxuries to go on Instagram and to be able to post a pretty photo of you drinking a beer at a music festival and, you know, relish in your, you know, independence. Yeah. Well, a few years ago um, when I was still in Australia, I felt like the trend almost started there of influencers adopting that yeah. it was either ADHD, ADHD or uh, autism. And there were a lot of them getting on that bandwagon. Um a lot and I was really seeing it and seeing it 
as a trend. And I know that I reached out to you and we did some podcasts about it. Cause you know, I know that you, you know, you worked in the autism sector and like you're an expert on this and you know, the, the real deal. And, uh, we discussed it a lot and yeah, if look, if you're like truly autistic, you're not going to be at a music festival. Like that's those noises alone are going to be like triggering you. And you're not going to be and- drinking beer at a music festival with your friends. And, you know, the thing is, I don't doubt that there are people that are being diagnosed with um, ADHD and all of these things. Look, I think some of the, di- look, you can fucking get diagnosed for anything if you go to the right doctor. But yeah. I think that, um, I think some of these diagnoses are definitely legit. You know, I don't know yeah. if it's because there's more awareness. I don't know if it's things that we have in the fucking food that are like messing with this girl. It could be a lot of things, but it's also like, I think when these influencers are coming out like the Tallulah Willises and, you know, I won't reference a bunch of Australians because your audience probably won't know who they are, but, um, you know, bachelor stars and stuff are coming out and suddenly going, I'm autistic. It's like, okay, if you want to like, if you want to sound off about that, at least acknowledge that, yeah, I've been yeah. diagnosed with like the most mild autism and I'm actually so lucky that I can do X, Y, Z and really, all it is is that maybe I get hyper fixated on fucking TikTok yeah. videos and certain noises annoy me and uh, <laughs> I'm not and on the level real. of someone that's... And that's yes. valid. And those experiences and those challenges that I'm sure Tallulah really did face growing up, that's real and that's valid. And I don't want to invalidate her experience, but don't go on fucking Instagram and try to position yourself as the fucking face of autism that you want to celebrate when I see families that are struggling every day. And the reality is they don't have caretakers. You know, it's part of the reason I've chosen to, you know, try to uh, kind of go back into that world and help fundraise for Home Life Community, which is my brother's doctor, Dr. Jerry Kartz. Now he's building a home in Tennessee um, to provide housing for these adults because the reality is once their parents are are, are gone, there's nobody that's going to take care of them, their kids, you know, and they become what? Wardens of the state? You know, I mean, that's a reality, even for my brother, that we have to think he's now 22. He's aged out of the school system. So it's like, okay, what's next for him? You know, and it's just like, these are the things, this is the side of autism we don't get to see on ABC or whatever, because you have the good doctor that shows, oh, this guy with autism is a young kid and he's a doctor and they must be geniuses. And that's not to say that they aren't incredibly, you know, gifted and smart individuals, but there is this other side of it that we don't talk about enough. And unfortunately, a mom that's trying to raise a kid. I mean, I have a cousin right now. She has two kids with autism. One of them is self-injurious, does speak will you know probably never be able to be independent on her own and she doesn't have time to be like Tallulah and post in between her music festivals about you know the joys of autism and you know when I see the Tallulahs of the world and the influencers coming through and and claiming these conditions for themselves I don't see them kind of like redirecting the attention back to like the real autism no. community no or the real the people that are really suffering it really turns into self-indulgent either I want some headlines and I want to you know go on entertainment I want to feel important like, yeah yeah or I want to use it to victimize myself and then I want to be able to do um Instagram ads for like headphones that block out noise uh and (sighs) and, you know stupid stuff like that instead of being like oh okay you know i've been diagnosed with this but here's what i've learned about this and these are the people that are like really going through it so let's like you know send some attention and money there they don't do that no because they don't give a fuck it's about themselves and about feeling important and having a sense of identity um and don't even get me started on the fucking headphones because that's a whole other thing with the headphones and like getting like because we worked very hard to get my brother to be in a place where he doesn't have to use those headphones. And there was a point where he was very dependent on them, but it became more of a, um, you know, it was some of his like OCD, like needing to, you know, f- feel comfortable with them on rather than him actually needing it. And so that was, listen, it's just, it's, it's a lot. We've been through a lot with him. And wait, I want to interrupt with, with yeah. you saying that because I, cause I covered this a lot a few years ago, especially I did like a lot of, um, of podcasts and articles and stuff on this i had a um well actually had a lot of parents that have autistic children that listen to me and would message me and one said that she had worked really hard similar to your story with ethan to um make the kids feel as normal as possible to not have them rely on a lot of these things and 
that's so different to the Tallulahs and, you know, the Bachelor stars and everything coming down with it, where they are so quick then to reach for this sort of autism AIDS yeah. um, and almost wear it like a fashion accessory. Yeah, and it's not a fashion accessory because some of us work really hard to make sure that that's not their everyday reality, you know? And it's yeah. it's it's so invalidating to people that really are struggling with this every day. Sorry you felt a little isolated. I think that that's real. I think that that's valid. I don't want to invalidate your experience and your truth, but acknowledge that there is a much harsher reality for many other people that are not in the teeny tiny minority of people that are going on Instagram to feel important for themselves. Period. <sighs> Sorry, it's just, it's something that's so personal to me that it, like, is no, so infuriating. You cried on my podcast once about it when we talked about it a few years ago because yeah. you were just, when you were first seeing the trend, you were like, I cannot believe that there are all these people coming out like this and you go on their Instagrams and, yeah, they're going to music festivals and, like, we, yeah. there's one there's one uh, celebrity in Australia that, I mean, she come, honestly, she's had everything. First it was ADHD and she milked the hell out of that. Then it was autism. Before that it was uh, PTSD. I mean, every ailment um, you could come up with she seems to have, but then you'll go on her Instagram and she's, like, hosting radio shows and I'm going on tour and, like, performing music and it's just, you know, and then apparently she's writing, like, a live stage show about being neurodivergent. It's like, oh, girl, come on. <laughs> Good for you. Um, so, uh, Rinna came out over the weekend and said that I believe it was on the talk that she is not returning to Beverly Hills. She has no intention, intention of returning to Real Houses of Beverly Hills. I think Rinna, I tweeted and I was like, Rinna's career is in such a different, better place now that she's not, I don't ever see her coming back to, to Real Housewives. She is doing so fucking well. And people like, are like, what is she doing? She's in a lifetime movie. Oh my God. Well, she produced the movie, I think, and put her daughter in it and everything. So she's hustling and again, giving her daughter a platform, the blonde one, because Amelia, what is it? Delilah and Amelia. Amelia's modeling career is, she's like a legit model now. Like, yeah, she's getting like big campaigns, Amelia which is kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one isn't doing as much, but now she's getting into acting. She's getting into music or whatever. But um, I've been so impressed by Lisa Rinna's post Beverly Hills career and I shouldn't have been surprised at all because I'm a huge Lisa Rinna fan going way back and I loved her on the show and I agreed with 99.9% .9 of things she did I don't think she actually ever was wrong on the show with the exception of when she lied about saying that Kim Richards was close to death yeah although I do actually think that she kind of, I do think she forgot she said that in the moment and then she realized she didn't she was like wait how do I admit that I actually said this and she did admit it like during yeah. the season you didn't have to you know, play the tape for her at the reunion. Um, and her career, if you followed it, she is a hustler and she reinvents herself all the time. And she's had a lot of different phases where it was doing the soaps or it was doing the reality TV stuff. Um, and, you know, she was doing the QVC thing for a long time and had a fashion boutique and, you know, did Playboy and she's just done all of these like fun things. And now, for her to be able to have like a fashion, you know, to become like a fashion icon post Beverly Hills, which is so cool. And it's so interesting because it's like she used Beverly Hills, right, to make yeah. her daughter to fashion stars in the same. She copied Yolanda. She saw what Yolanda did with Gigi and Bella. And she's like, I'm going to do that for my daughters. Then she got her daughters into the modeling scene. And then it's like the clout that the daughters got in the fashion and modeling world. Then they were able to channel that back to Rina and yeah. then she was able to like piggyback off of that and get invited to the front row of the fashion shows and um you know she got booked in the Ryan Murphy American Horror Story she's doing some like that um, was only one episode you know what people are such haters because it's like they really are do you, under do you understand that being in first of all she was never like an A-list actress and now she's like what 60 early 60s i think she's yeah. around 60 years she's old. 60 yeah she yeah she was on the housewives for almost a decade and to be able to go straight from that into an a, you know a ryan murphy production american horror story and she's booking other things for she's got that lopez versus lopez or whatever it is like yeah she's booking stuff like and it doesn't matter if did, it's one what was the one she just did with uh was it rebecca gayhart 
There was one. Yeah, that might be the. That's, she's she's booked. Like, yeah, she's it's not Lopez like, and Lopez, and it's not American Horror Stories. It was another one that that just aired, um, where she plays like a, a a news anchor or something. So she's consistently, and she has her Lifetime movie. So she's consistently been booked in big productions. I mean, even in the fashion world, like what? Who at? in their late 50s, 60 years old, breaks into the fashion world. I mean, you have like Heidi Klum and um, Naomi Campbell who are, they were supermodels back in their day and they're always going to be supermodels. But like Lisa Wren is somebody that started so late in the game, is on the cover of magazines, is walking in fashion shows, is sitting front row at New York Fashion Week. Like what other housewife is doing that? She's sitting front row, like Paris Fashion Week. Yeah. Like, and, you know, she got the cover of Cosmopolitan that was the oldest ever cover model she was on. I think it was um, th- these like fashion books. Like, she's getting like legit covers and, and press and shooting with like <laughs> proper fashion photographers. And she's being dressed by like Mugler and like Balenciaga. Like, this is legit. People want to hate. Um, and it separates her so much from, say, like Dorit Kemsley, who actually have really been loving Dorit, especially last season of the show. For me, she had like a actually really good season. Um, I hate her style for the most part. I think it's so new money tacky. Yeah. And I always thought Lisa Rinna was actually one of the best dressed on the show. I was a big fan of her style because she knew how to kind of like dress down, but then she would sort of take risks and do things that were kind of fun. And you could tell that she actually had a real sense of style as opposed to, Dorit, who kind of cuts and pastes outfits and it's all about the logos and it's like it's overdressed and the outfit sort of tends to wear Dorit. And she likes to go out and say she's the best dressed housewife and the fashion icon. It's like, do you think Dorit Kemsley would ever get invited to one of these fashion events that Lisa Rinna has gone to? Not in a million fucking years. I don't think any housewife really would i mean yolanda would because she's the mother of two of the biggest supermodels of their generation but like you know in terms of reality television most people are not i mean garcelle who people love to praise and worship girl garcelle ain't getting invited anywhere and if you saw her qvc or hsn um bedroom decor it was honestly the ugliest thing it was so hideous well i mean it's just like People like let's take working actresses, right? Look at Garcelle or look at Denise Richards and compare them to where Lisa's career is at right now. And it's like, like Denise is struggling. She's on OnlyFans selling her coochie and was lucky enough to book a lifetime movie that was uh mirrored after real housewives. Like that's the caliber that she's at right now, where she's on shows that she's getting booked on, not because she's Denise Richards, but because it's from Housewives World and she's just choosing to lean into that. You know? Also like pull up Garcelle's IMDB page, you know? It's just like I think Rinna is in a good space. I know people hate her, but it's like hate her, but she you still have to give her credit, you know? Yeah, and you know, I I don't want to say who it is, but I was talking to an ex-housewife that's been in a lot of controversy and a lot of people are hating on, and she's doing some stuff in, you know, Hollywood type stuff, and she was like, trust me out here, like, no one really gives a fuck about this reality TV housewife stuff, like, they don't really even look at it that much, so um, I think the Bravo fandom, right, the Beverly Hills fandom, they love to hate Lisa Rinna so much, but I think she's, you know, going out and auditioning for things and like these, like they don't care. They're just like, you know, she's fun and they see the star quality there and they see the campiness of it. And they're like, yeah, Lisa Rinna would be great in this. It's not, you know, some Karen at home raging on their keyboard that's commenting under every like Bravo meme account about how terrible Lisa Rinna is. Like, sorry, no one that's actually like calling the shots and like booking people and that is actually relevant and like matters in the industry yeah. cares that Lisa Rinna was like a bitch to Kathy Hilton. You know, yeah, from the when housewives. you get out of that like echo chamber of Bravo Housewives world, you realize like that stuff, like re- that's why I was so surprised to see Bethany lean back into Housewives because she was so far out of that. And like had real television production deals and fumbled that ball only to just come right back to Housewives and TikTok. And I'm like, 
outside. And she even said that like her publicist was like, don't go and do a housewives podcast because like people don't care about that stuff outside of <clears throat> that world. Um, yeah, no, a hundred percent. But Bethany, Bethany's biggest skill beyond making like brands and stuff. Cause really she's had the skinny girl cocktails was lightning in a bottle and that was huge. And then she just licensed it onto everything. But like a lot of other stuff that she's tried to launch has actually flopped, but yeah. where she's really good is the whole publicity game. Like she's the yeah. fame whore and a media whore and she's like elite at it. And she knows when to pivot and when to lean into housewives and when to not. So yeah. it's kind of like, she left Housewives that first time. She did some other, you know, talk shows, et cetera. They flopped. She came back. She had an incredible run with her second time on the Housewives and killed it again, just like she did during her original time. She yeah. was like the biggest housewife. Then she left, did some other stuff, tried to do some business shows, tried to be on Shark Tank, got some mileage out of that, but then they kind of didn't work out in the long run. So she went back in the Housewives, got a lot of clout, a lot of headlines, did some controversial interviews she got the Raquel exclusive before anybody else like you know she did that for a while and then once she got this whole you know TikTok influencing thing going which she has become a legit influencer now for sure she's definitely getting paid a lot of money to do a lot of those posts um she was like yeah I don't need to fucking talk about housewives now because people are following me to watch me you know eat a donut at yeah. 3 a.m and rant about oh my god these donuts are on the level you've got to go to to Duncan on fifth street you know <laughs> so like and then if that stops working if the influencing dies out or say she'll fucking, find another way to she's a cockroach yeah, that's they ban, she's a cockroach they ban TikTok they ban TikTok, she'll move somewhere else. So one thing about her, she is a hustler and she'll always find a way to survive. I just find her highly obnoxious and like Oh, well, of course. But you know, that's I mean, Lisa Rin is a hustler too. Like, yeah. you know, you're a hustler. Like, I mean, sure if no filter if something happened to no filter, you would, you know, find another way to I will never let anything happen to no filter. This is the <laughs> baby that I have kept alive and sustainable for nine fucking years through all my other career highs and lows over the past decade. Um, this is one that I will always I, I've evolved it in many different ways over the past nine years but that's you know resilience you have to play the long game Jacques listen I go online and I stream to the same numbers as other people's YouTube channels that want to compete with me that have a lot more subscribers on them why Period. because I have a product that people actually enjoy consuming it really is about the long game and yeah. it's just about I think being authentic and things work out in ways that you don't expect them to like well yeah we I've were also some... we were also just talking about like the the um the smoke and mirrors of numbers and how sometimes people shoot to the top of the charts or sometimes people really peak in certain areas but if you don't know how to ride those waves and you don't know how to play the long game and be in it for the longevity those highs you're not going to be able to last when you come back down because you don't have that tenacity a hundred percent. It's about having the talent. Like I saw that um, these girls, the pop apologists that I'm friendly with, I really like them. Oh yeah, I've them. been on they've their got... show. I think they've been on my show too. We've done uh, collabs in the past. Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't been on their show yet, but I want to be. And um, they got a ton of followers from the Kate Middleton thing because they oh, were yeah. following that. Yeah. And then when she got cancer, people were like, I can't believe you, whatever. Spread conspiracies about Kate. But <laughs> they got, you know, a ton of numbers off of that. And then, you know, people turned on them after the Kate thing. But I was like, they're going to be fine because yeah. they actually have talent. They actually have a quality show before the Kate thing. It's just wasn't in front of as many people. And now more people can see it. Whereas I think with some of these you know, sometimes I see certain like Instagrammers or whatever will go viral off of just doing like a deep dive on something or whatever they'll have. Maybe they'll get a really juicy exclusive on their podcast yeah. and I see their numbers shoot up, but I look at it and I'm like, bitch, you're, you, you're going to have no career in a month because you don't have the skills or the talent or the personality. They don't know or... how to ride the waves. And you're right. No. Like the pop apologists, they have, they have really great branding they are yeah. very talented girls. They're not afraid to give a hot take. And I don't think that they will 
fizzle out after. I mean, I think, listen, we've all been there where we've had, you know, to ride those waves. They are smart and talented and I think they will be just fine. Um, Whereas like other people, like you say, and that's why these people, they do like a deep dive on their TikTok for a hot second and then they're hot for like a week and then they kind of fizzle out and disappear. It's like you have to constantly keep figuring out how to keep an audience engaged and that's a skill set and a talent. Yeah, so much is the authenticity, I think, in building a real connection with people. Um, Because I see a lot of people as well that really, they build their numbers from gaming the algorithm of just like, okay, like this is like trending and I'm going to like keep spamming this topic. And that's what they're doing constantly. But it's like, that's the only reason people are following you. And once you stop doing that, they're not going to be there. Whereas, you know, my podcast is like quite small, but I've had a lot of like super loyal listeners with me from the beginning. And I've changed, like I started out doing a lot of Bravo and now I've really like, I don't do that much. I do it more on Patreon, but on my main show, there's not a lot of it. It's only, although funnily enough, I am actually going to be talking about Bravo later this week with Brandy and Julie. But anyway, I've had people you know, they followed me through different avenues I've gone because, yeah. you know, they know that I'm authentic and they like my personality and, you know, my takes on things. Whereas I know there's other people that if they ever did like a pivot, like they their numbers would go They're to zero. done, yeah. yeah. No, no I think have it. you do have a very authentic brand and you're very unapologetic about, you know, what your takes are and what your interests are. Um, and some people up in these YouTube streets are just as fake as their veneers. And, you know, <laughs> good luck to them. Um, well, I'm, I keep it real and unapologetic with you too off camera, don't I? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. There's always, Jock is the one person that I know I can go to that will always keep it 100 with me. I will push back at him sometimes. Um, but yes, he's the one that will always keep it 100 on and off camera. And wait, and what's good about you, I want to say, is that you don't get overly offended because I probably no. can be too harsh at times. No, well, and... we were at a coffee shop the other day and you were like getting mad at me about a certain situation. I'm like, Jacques, this is my situation to figure out. I go, I don't, I know you may not like or agree with what I'm doing in this particular situation, but if this is a lesson that I need to learn, you need to let me learn my fucking lesson. And, you know. Yes. And and you know that it comes from a good place yeah. and you don't get pissy and weird about it. You're like, you're cool about it, which is good. Like, I think we can both be honest with each other. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I can actually be pretty sensitive. So I think some people, sometimes I'm like, don't be honest with me. Cause actually I'll just be honest that I can't take the <laughs> very I feel sensitive like I have times, a little. You're tough. I, I, but I have, I have tact. I can, yeah. I know how to deliver the message without, you just give it to me straight and I'm just like, and I can, I, I will take it, but like, you are a little more sensitive though. No, I am. And you know that, which is nice. So then you will sugarcoat it a bit to make sure it doesn't kind of push my buttons. Where you're just like, girl, you, you look once. so, yeah. You're like, girl, you look, and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> give me my beating. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Jacques. Listen, I've been beaten up on the internet for long enough that I, I can take a little heat. I can't. I bl- I block it all out. I turned off comment. I turned off replies on my Instagram stories unless I'm following you. Like, I can't see it. I can't take it. Like, I'm like very sensitive. Like, I don't want it. it I feel like I'm. It, when I get a comment that's like a specific comment that's like negative to me, um, it feels to me as if someone came into my like home and like took a shit on my fucking carpet. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Like I didn't ask to hear your negative ass opinion of me. Like you are getting blocked. I, yeah, I'm not good at it. You're really good at letting it roll off your back. And I know that you don't even look at it that much anymore, which is healthy. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I'll like glance at it sometimes because I do like to respond to like the nice stuff. So I'll like glance at it. But the second I start to see it look like it's going to go negative or it's going to be nasty, like I just like won't even finish. I'll just keep scrolling. Yeah. And when I met some of the, um, the new people from the Valley, I was chatting to them and I'm like, honestly, I said, don't read the comments. And they're yeah. like, oh, we, we, you know, we, we want to read the comments because they're new and I get it. It's exciting. And people are talking about them. And I said, well, just don't take them that seriously because if you take the good comments seriously, you've got to take the bad comments yeah. seriously. And I'm telling you, like, something's going to happen and then people are going to hate you and you're going to have the most insane fucking Karen people up your ass about 
something on this show that was probably out of context and completely edited and that they don't even understand and don't even realize that it's entertainment and think that it's like a real serious documentary. So that's really going to weigh on you if you start feeling yourself from the good comments. So just take it with a grain of salt. Take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. And again, the, you, because some people will also get too fixated on the, good comments without realizing that like that'll only just feed your ego and it's just like you have to just look at the noise as all noise altogether you know yep and just and i always say and i said this i was just on tk's uh making moves podcast i'm like i gauge success based off of engagement if there's a lot of engagement and it's quality engagement then i've invoked some sort of reaction in people and that's how i know i've done my job correctly effectively quality quality engagement right. is the key yeah. Not like, yes, girl. Like dumb, <laughs> stupid comments like that. Or just like fire emojis, fire emojis, fire emojis. It's like, no, I uh, like I, thoughtful commentary. I leave a fire emoji on. Well, yeah, but like not when your whole feed is just random fire yeah. emojis. That's not quality engagement, you know? Well, I always think bots. When I see that yeah. someone's, yeah, and it's all emojis, I'm like, someone's been buying some bots. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, go and subscribe to Jacques' Patreon and listen to his podcast. It's called Unpopular with Jacques Peterson. I've been on a number of times, and I'm sure he'll you'll have to come back, and we'll have to talk more about Beverly Hills and predictions and all of that stuff um, when you come back on the podcast. A hundred, yes, anytime you want. And guys, yes, check out my podcast, um, Unpopular with Jacques Peterson. I'm having Brandy and Julie on later this week. And yes, that actually is partially going to be a Bravo episode because they were with me at the Valley premiere. But uh, last week I did a Love is Blind episode. Sometimes I talk about politics. Sometimes I I just rant about stuff going on in my life. I've been talking a lot about my uh, adventures in the US since I've come over here from Australia and how much I hate New York and how much (laughs) I love LA and California. So yeah, check it out, guys. Thanks. Yes, check it out. Go give him some love. Follow him at Unpopular JP online. You can follow me at Just Plain Zach or follow the podcast at No Filter with Zach and catch No Filter. Monday through Thursday, we stream live first thing in the morning, Monday through Thursday on YouTube. And then we have bonus episodes that drop for No Filter Plus members on Apple Podcasts on Fridays. Or you can join our YouTube members only on Thursday evenings. It is a No Filter after dark and we get unhinged. So be sure to subscribe. Tune in, hit the like button on your way out. Go show Jacques some love. Um, Show me some love. And if you haven't done so yet, catch my new show, Disaster Daters, with me and Jeff Epstein, available on all podcast platforms, or you can watch it exclusively on Spotify. We have new episodes coming soon, so be sure to subscribe now. All right, guys. Love you. Mean it. Ciao for now. Bye.